Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome. Thank you very much for uh, joining us today. Um, I am Gideon Taylor, president of the World Jewish Restitution Organization, or WJRO. So the webinar today is part of a series of hashtag my property story. Um, the webinar today is called Chasing Portraits, the Quest to Recover Art Lost During the Holocaust. Um, very happy to see a number of returning participants and to extend a warm welcome to new attendees who are joining us today. The purpose of these webinars is to create a platform for us to come together, uh, to share knowledge, and to form uh, connections as we address this critical issue of Holocaust property restitution. So the film Chasing Portraits beautifully exemplifies the profound significance of property in preserving the memory and personal history of Holocaust survivors. The tangible artifacts serve as a powerful link to the past, and through them, we can gain valuable insights into their experience and resilience of those uh, connected with those uh, items and those, um, those artifacts. Um, for us, dealing with Holocaust restitution, sometimes it relates to big political and legal issues. But ultimately, property restitution is about individuals and individual pieces of property and the connection and relationship between them. I thank you for your presence here today, for your commitment to our cause. Uh, we will continue to work with these collective efforts to raise awareness about the importance of Holocaust property restitution and to help elevate the issue and create uh, personal connections that contribute to that um, broader goal of achieving justice for those who had their property wrongfully taken from them during the Shoah. I'd like to now turn the floor over to Mark Weitzman, the Chief Operating Officer of WGRO, who will guide us through the webinar. Thank you once again for your participation. Thank you, Gideon. Hello, I'm Mark Weitzman, Chief Operating Officer of the World Jewish Restitution Organization, WJRO. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the Hashtag My Property Story webinar, Chasing Portraits, The Quest to Recover Art Lost During the Holocaust. Our webinar series has been very well received over the past several years, and we are really happy to resume the series, especially with this critically acclaimed movie, Chasing Portraits. Today, we are truly an international gathering as we are joined by people from more than 20 different countries. As many of you are aware, WJRO represents world jury in pursuing claims for the recovery of Jewish properties in Eastern and Central Europe. Our member organizations are 14 major Jewish international and Holocaust survivor organizations in the US, Israel, and Europe. The webinar series builds upon the global conversation sparked over the last two years during the hashtag my property story social media campaign which is based on the personal stories of Holocaust survivors and their families who are seeking justice for the expropriation of their property. We are very fortunate to be joined today by the critically acclaimed author and filmmaker, Elizabeth Reinecke. She turned her 2016 book, Chasing Portraits, a great granddaughter's quest for her lost art legacy, about our efforts to rescue her great, great, her great grandfather's lost paintings into a 2018 documentary film with the same name. The film received rave reviews in the New York Times, the LA Times, the Jewish Journal, and Haaretz, just to name a few. I hope many of you had a chance to watch the movie, which we made available through a link by registering for the web, uh, for this webinar. If you are not able to watch it yet, it will be available until the end of the day. It's also available on a number of streaming services, and we strongly urge you to do so. The content of the film is at the core of WJRO's mission. Almost 80 years after the end of World War II, Holocaust survivors and their families around the world are still looking to get back their property that were wrongly taken away from them. Sadly, they continue to wait for the restitution or compensation for their property wrongly seized by the Nazis and their allies or subsequently nationalized by the communist regimes. As the film shows, this property has deep meaning. We often speak of property at homes, land or businesses, but cherished personal and familial items, such as paintings, were also wrongfully taken away or destroyed. During the Holocaust, the Nazis and their allies robbed millions of Jews of their every possession, as well as property belonging to the Jewish community. Each item represented a different memory, a loved one, 
a childhood cut short, a lifetime of labor, generations of history, a legacy, people's lives that were taken. Property restitution is a bad family history, the memory and recognition of Jews that were deported and murdered, and what was left behind. Holocaust era property restitution is a live issue. A few years ago, both President Biden and Secretary of State Blinken committed to prioritize the restitution of Holocaust property. Um, in 2021, President Biden pledged, quoting, that the United States will continue to champion justice for Holocaust survivors and their heirs, end quote. In March, Secretary of State Blinken assured the World Jewish Restitution Organization that he, as U.S. ambassadors, would urge countries to comply with their com commitments on Holocaust era uh, property restitution. He noted it is troubling and unacceptable that the work of restitution or providing a measure of compensation for property wrongfully seized during the Holocaust is still not complete in so many countries, end quote. Pursuing justice for Holocaust survivors and their families has been an acknowledgement of what happened. And it's also an answer to the rising tide of Holocaust distortion that we see present in today's world. And that leads us directly to the question of history. What connects you to your family's history? Is it possible to reconnect to that history, to reclaim it? Today, Elizabeth Reinecke is going to take us on what turned out to be a very unexpected journey to reconnect to our family's property in Poland. We're going to look at how her journey might be relevant to your own personal experiences. We are deeply honored as well to have on our panel today, Dr. Wesley Fisher, Director of Research for the Claims Conference at WJRO, as well as filmmaker, Elizabeth Reinecke. Before we get started, I want to go over agenda for today and a little bit of housekeeping. If you have any questions, please type them in at any time into the question back at the bottom of the screen. We'll be monitoring the questions throughout the webinar, and we'll try to have the panel address as many of the questions that we have time for at the end of the presentation. First, we will watch a clip for the movie, then we'll have a presentation from Dr. Wesley Fisher, Director of Research at the Claims Conference at WJRO, and then we will open it up to filmmaker Elizabeth Reinecke, and we will open it up for questions and answers. Before I introduce our panel members, I invite you to watch a clip for the film, Chasing Portraits. Here's some background about the movie. Moshe Ranetsky, 1881 to 1943, was a prolific Warsaw-based artist who painted scenes of the Polish Jewish community at this interwar for years. Sadly, he was murdered in Majdanek. After the Holocaust, Moshe's wife was only able to recover a small fraction of his work, but unbeknownst to the family, many other pieces survived. For more than a decade, his great-granddaughter, Elizabeth Reinecke, has searched for the missing art with remarkable and unexpected success. Spanning three generations, the documentary is a deeply moving narrative of the richness of one man's art, the devastation of war, and one woman's unexpected path to healing. It's hard work, Elizabeth. Yeah, I know. The emotion and what transpired. I mean, it's awfully personal. I'm looking for the work of my great-grandfather. He was a Jewish painter in Warsaw in the interwar years. Whoa. Somebody told him that I might see something, and so I'm curious. Impossible. And so, impossible. You know, I've not been to Poland since I left. There are a couple of ways that people will tell you they deal with the war years. Uh, one of them is to try to reconcile themselves to all of it, and the other is to forget it. Uh, I try not to think too much about it. When Elizabeth is going to Poland in October. She asked me if I want to go with her, and I said, no, I don't. My great-grandfather's paintings are so much more to me than art objects. These paintings are like family members to me. To touch his work is to bridge what was lost in the Holocaust and to feel connected with him. The Chronicle, the Jewish community in Poland, the largest in Europe. He was not an outsider looking at him. He was part of it. People starting to ask questions. Okay, this is my town. And what was before? Half of the inhabitants were Jewish. The train was bombed and the Polish villagers rubbed the boxes with the paintings. What stops you from trying to steal these things? Some people, when they come looking, are here to reclaim paintings. Mm -hmm. Were you guys afraid about my coming here? No. No? No, not at all. Why? 
The miracle of it surviving is so great. Those pictures were his connection to his family. That was a wonderful clip from the movie. Now, I have the honor to introduce you to Dr. Wesley Fisher. His full title is Director of Research Conference on Jewish Material Claims Against Germany, the Claims Conference, and World Jewish Restitution Organization, head of the Claims Conference, WJRO Looted Art and Cultural Property Initiative. Dr. Fisher leads the efforts, particularly in the restitution of movable property plundered in the Holocaust. He spearheads the Looted Art and Cultural Property Initiative, working globally to promote provenance research and uh, claims processes in all countries. He was deputy director of the Washington Conference of Holocaust-Related uh, Assets that resulted in the Washington Conference principles on the Nazi confiscated art. He has specialized in making the archival records of the culture looting by the Nazis and their allies accessible. With extensive experience, he played key roles in establishing the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum and the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, IHRA. He holds degrees from Harvard and Columbia University. Wesley will touch on several uh, themes and issues, including the importance of the history of how plunder took place and the question of where art belongs. Wesley, please. I promise not to keep you too long from Elizabeth Reinecke, who is the a creator of the film and obviously of greater interest. Um, but there are a couple of different topics that I think may be useful in understanding some aspects of the film. First of all, if we look at the question of persecuted Jewish artists, there were a great many of them. In the mid 19th century, Jews had begun to enter the field of art and had begun to use the different images and such that are in art. Um, unfortunately, of those who survived the Holocaust or those who were murdered, only a very few are known worldwide. These are mostly people coming from France or from uh, elsewhere in Europe, in, including Poland, who are in the Ecole de Paris. Uh, you know, of course, of Marc Chagall, you may know of Chaim Soutine and other such people, but there were many, many other Jewish artists. The, we are trying to create a list, a, com a compilation of all the artists who were at least professionally um, uh, presented by exhibitions and the like during their lifetime who were persecuted in these various countries and to make that known. At the moment, we have a thousand names. The thousand names are from Germany and France and Poland. Um, clearly, in the case of Moshe Renetsky, as pronounced in Polish, uh, that in the case of Elizabeth's great grandfather, he is now far better known than he was. And that's due to Elizabeth Reinecke. Um, I think that it's notable that there is a constant discussion about the nature of Jewish art as to whether or not Jewish art can in fact show images, whether it's supposed to show Jewish life. In the case of Moshe Renetsky, it's showing Jewish life, both in its secular form and in its religious form. A second point I'd like to make is that in the film, Carla Chaperot of the University of California talks about being a claimant versus being an historian. And Elizabeth Reinecke decides that she will be an historian in this case. That's very important. It's important partly, partly because there are problems, as I'll discuss, with trying to get things back from various countries, including Poland. But it's also important because the history of how the plunder took place and the post-war fate of cultural objects is not very well known. And the history is sometimes as important as the actual objects. It's not, of course, as important to the families, but it is also of major interest. And so it's something to be, to be recognized. Thirdly, there's a question that is constantly raised of where art belongs. Where should looted artworks now reside? With the original owner's family? In public institutions, in Jewish public institutions? Otherwise? In private hands other than those of the original owner's family? It's not an easy question, and it's not answered in one way. 
Uh, we see in a number of countries, such as France at the moment, there is movement towards taking the artworks out of the public sphere and making them available to the families of the original owners. That's very good, but there are other people who would say, well, that they should stay in the museums, they should in fact be open to the public generally. Another point, in regard to Poland, uh, after World War II, the Polish government took all the Jewish art and all the Jewish archives and over mostly to the Jewish Historical Institute, which in the film Elizabeth Reinecke visits. Uh, and this is an interesting matter. Uh, Teresa Smiakowska in the film uh, answers, as you just saw in the, expert, in the excerpt that was uh, shown, that the she is not troubled, and the Jewish Historical Institute is not troubled or afraid at Elizabeth Reinecke's visit that she will somehow want to take these things back with her and the like. That is partly because Poland doesn't give anything back. Poland is one of the few countries that has refused to do that almost completely. The notion is that Poland suffered and Anything that's there in Poland, whether it was something that was found after the war, as in the case of many of the artworks of Moshe Renetsky, or whether it was something which was found in Poland simply because of the transfer of borders, whereby the uh, eastern part of Germany became the western part of Poland, and there were many things that were found there. Um, whether Whatever that may be, that basically it's sort of too bad, this is owed to Poland. Poland has a huge program of trying to receive back those artworks which were taken from the country, including artworks that were taken from Jews um, or from private citizens generally. However, uh, this is a case where they have a full-scale staff that works on this. The most recent example of this is actually today, so far as I can see from the newspapers, it is uh, the return of an artwork that was taken from Poland that was found in Japan. And this is, this is a worldwide enterprise, but they do not give things back otherwise. This includes something which is really quite reprehensible, so far as I can tell, which is that found in Poland, in the, well, in the south, in the southwest of Poland, from the what was left over from what had been Germany, are, is the Judaica of the Greek Jews. The Judaica of the Greek Jews has nothing to do with Polish history, has nothing to do with Polish culture. It is something which the director, the previous director of the Jewish Historical Institute has said that he thought should go back to Greece, but the Ministry of Culture of Poland has refused to do anything of that sort. Thus, in a sense, the statement that, that uh, by Teresa Smiakowska that she's not afraid, of course, in part, an interpretation can be, of course, she's not afraid because it can't be done. The only thing that uh, Elizabeth Reinecki, Reinecki, I'm sorry, Reinecki, um, receives back is from an individual person in Poland who kindly gives her back uh, one of uh, her great grandfather's uh, artworks. Uh, lastly, I would turn to this question that yes, it's a major matter that this type of looking at lost property, at looted property, and trying to see where it is, getting it back if possible, is a part of understanding of one's own family. It's not just understanding of the artwork, it's understanding of what that artwork meant to the family, meant to the original owners, or the, in this case, the artist himself. And artworks can be seen as Holocaust survivors too. They have historical value for the individual family, but also beyond for the greater world. As Yehudit Shendar of Yad Vashem says in the film, Art is not part of what historians study, but it's a really major part of the history. I'll close with that. Thank you. Thank you, Wesley. Um, before I introduce the next speaker, I just want to remind people that they have the option to submit questions into the chat. Please take the opportunity to do so. We'd love to hear from you. 
Um, it's a very provocative and a very uh, interesting topic here. And you have the opportunity to direct, uh, connect directly with uh, the people who were involved in it. Um, and I have the great pleasure of introducing you to the filmmaker, Elizabeth Reinecke. Elizabeth Reinecke is the great granddaughter of the Polish Jewish artist, artist Moshe Reinecki, 1880-1943. She grew up with the paintings prominently displayed in the walls of her family home and understood from an early age that the art connected her to a legacy from the old country, from Poland. In 2016, Penguin Random House published Chasing Portraits, a great granddaughter's quest for a lost art legacy, but her efforts to rescue her great grandfather's lost paintings. In 2018, she completed a documentary film of the same name. It is distributed by First Run Features. Elizabeth earned a BA in rhetoric from Bates College in 1991 and an MA in rhetoric and communications from UC Davis in 1994. Elizabeth resides in Oakland with her husband, two sons, and three black cats. Mm -hmm. I also have a surprise panelist that we would like to introduce you to. Many of you might recognize him from the film, Elizabeth's father, Alex Reinecke. Alex is the grandson of the artist Moshe Reinecki. He's a Holocaust survivor from Poland and an integral part of the storytelling process of the film. Welcome to both Elizabeth and Alex. I want to start off with perhaps with a question that I have um, as, uh, as I was watching this, and it just struck me that this is an intensely personal story, a family legacy, a family quest to recover great-grandfather's heritage and so on. And yet, by making it public, it became, you took the, uh, uh, the option, opportunity to make it public, and even as Wesley uh, just pointed out, a little bit of a political story as well. Um, was that intentional on your part? How do you feel about that today? Was there a goal that you want to accomplish beyond telling the story? Um, and, and has that re reverberated back on, uh, on you know, a few years after the completion of the film? Well, that's a long-winded question with lots of parts, but um, let me just give a little bit of history and say that um, in the late 90s, when the internet was kind of a new thing and nobody really knew what to do with it, um, my dad and I decided that we should have the paintings in our possession professionally photographed and that I would build a website to share them. Because the idea was that my great grandfather really wasn't well known beyond our family. There had been a small exhibit at a museum here in Berkeley, California at the Magnus Museum. But beyond that, he wasn't very well known. And there was, you know, beside, aside from the idea of leading group tours uh, through our private collection, the internet was a great way to share it far and wide. And so my father really supported that idea and encouraged it. Um, and the film really grew from the idea of um, sort of two things. One, I've always loved documentary film. It seemed like a great way to share the story further. Um, I had become interested in issues of Holocaust era art restitution um, and I and YouTube had recently been invented um, and I was playing with the idea of, of doing short YouTube presentations, which I never did. I met several people who are documentary filmmakers and um, and decided to go forward with that with a, a huge endorsement and encouragement from from my dad and dad, maybe you want to unmute yourself and, and say a few words about that. Alex, can we, if you want to I, join, I think you're muted still, perhaps. Yeah, I think he's looking. While you're looking, he's, I actually wanted to uh, direct a question to Alex as well. There. Oh, there. Uh, there we go. Okay. Then I'll, I, I'll, I think it's muted. Can you hear me now? Yes. Well, I think Elizabeth's idea to share the art was a very good one, and she was very successful at doing it. Um, our purpose was none other than to share that Jewish history and the Jewish history of the art. Alex, was there something that you learned about your grandfather that you might not have known before the documentary, before this project began, 
This is something that surprised you in, that came out? I'm not sure what to tell you. Um, I was born before the war, um, and the war started when I was three years old. I know from my father telling me that my grandfather had met me, uh, but I have no memory of him at all. I don't remember meeting him, having any interaction with him. Um, so I learned, like everyone else, about all the things that he had been doing. Okay. Um, now we're actually going to show one of uh, one of Moshe Reinitsky's uh, paintings. In the film, Elizabeth said that the, that the painting, Luna Park, was her favorite. Can you explain why and what's the connection uh, to the painting? Um, if we could show the uh, painting on screen now, great. Um, Elizabeth, Alex, if you could address that. Yeah, so, you know, growing up, my great grandfather's paintings were on the walls of my parents' home as well as my grandparents' home. And so, um, you know, I didn't really understand the images that I was looking at. Um, I didn't know if they were scenes that he imagined or that he saw and painted. Um, and one of the things that I loved about Luna Park was that it was festive and celebratory. And none of my great grandfather's paintings are, are depressing because of course they become before the war. So the Holocaust really isn't portrayed in any of his paintings. There are a very small number of pieces that were done in the very early days of the war. Um, so this is a, a, a celebration of the, the Jewish community in Poland before the war. Um, and as I wrote about his work in my book and, and stared for a long periods of time at these pieces to try to see what more I could learn, you know, I began to see things that as a kid, I didn't really see. So you'll see, I can't, I don't have a pointer to be able to point, but um, on top of the tent on the far left is a white and red flag and one of, yep. And then one of the characters in the kind of the foreground at the bottom is also carrying a white and red flag. And that of course is the flag of Poland. And so that to me was, I don't know, like it's not a hidden thing, but it was exciting to me to, to really understand, um, you know, that this was Poland. Um, I love, you know, I think we all love at some juncture in our lives, a carnival, a festival. You can see all these people on the, the swirling, I don't know what it's properly called, but they're, you know, um, it's, it's like a swing and it's, it's swirling about. And so that's really wonderful. I can feel almost like I can hear the music and imagine the cotton candy. I can see in the right hand side of the screen, it's a merry go round with horses. And so to me, it's just a really delightful celebratory um, moment, uh, kind of a frozen moment in time, um, well before the Second World War. And for that reason, it brings me a lot of joy. I think you really touched upon something quite important there, which is when we talk about art connection to the Holocaust, we sometimes look at it through a lens of the Holocaust and assume it's going to reflect the horrors of what are you know we associate with the Holocaust, and yet we have to remember that a lot of the the objects that we're talking about were objects of life that were created before the Holocaust, that reflected life before the Holocaust, the world that was destroyed, the culture that was destroyed, and this painting, in a, in a sense, connects to that and speaks very much directly to it. Um, there's another wonderful painting we'd like to show: a self-portrait of your great grandfather. Uh, what do you think it says about him in, in this uh, in this portrait? We could show, share the screen and show that portrait now. Yeah, up there, the, well, it's slightly blocked. Hopefully everybody can see more of it. There we go. So, you know, as my dad said, he really didn't know his grandfather. And by the time I started on this project, my grandpa George um, had been, my grandpa George died in 1992 and I started this project um, in 2008. So uh, there was never an opportunity to ask him. Um, so if you're doing family projects, I encourage you to ask family while you still can. 
Um, but this painting to me was really telling. I felt like I learned a lot about my great grandfather from this painting. So what I see is, um, it, this is him in the lower right hand corner. He's looking right at us. He's actually sort of um, ever so slightly not part of the scene that he's painting, which I find interesting. He's looking at us, the viewer. I'm not quite sure what it is that he's, you know, thinking, but what I see is that he is wearing um, what I would call Western garb. He's wearing a suit and a, a collared shirt and a tie. Um, when we uh, think of Jews in Poland in the pre-war period, Oftentimes the generic thought is shtetl, um, uneducated, unsophisticated, not very worldly. That's not what I see when I look at my great grandfather. I see an urban man who is, um, you know, well dressed and um, and not, you know, at least visually not particularly Jewish in quotes. Um, the scene that I think he's painting is a, is a wedding. Uh, it seems partially unfinished to me, which is interesting. Um, these characters that he's painting are more typically Jewish. Um, the long beards, um, some of the clothing just to me sort of um, articulates the same sort of images you might see like in a Roman Vishniak photograph. To me, those are the same sorts of characters. And then uh, sort of between the wedding and himself is this violinist, which is, I love, it's almost um, impressionistic and sort of floating there. Um, it's very ethereal, I would say. And it's hard to see on this screen, but there are these swirls that come through the painting, which I love. Um, it's a, a little bit of whimsy. And so while I think that my great grandfather um, painted the scenes that he observed and, and in that way was kind of an ethnographer. He also was very much a creative artistic person inspired by other artists and um, I'm often told that people see some impressionistic styles, which could be very true. Um, you know, certainly Jews in, in Warsaw in the 1920s, um, early 1930s, you know, they traveled to Western Europe, they went to Paris, they would have been influenced by other artists. And I, I think you see some of that here. Dad, do you want to say anything about this painting? Um, not particularly this one, but I have in my office a, a pen and ink and brush and ink uh, self-portrait of my grandfather. Um, I don't know if it's readily accessible in this webinar, uh, but I look at that every day and I look at his expression, which is similar to this painting and yet much different. Um, and, and I always think of him, as you know, Elizabeth, we don't have any photographs of him. Right, there are no known photographs of my great grandfather. I believe there are four known portraits. Um, and so with each one, I feel like we understand my great grandfather a little bit better. The painting that my father just mentioned is in the documentary film and is on our website. So of course you can see it in those places. Mm -hmm. So these paintings are essentially the only tangible link you have to what your great grandfather grandfather looked like and, and, the, and the world that he inhabited. Yes, and Mark, I would say what's even more profound is that my great grandfather actually painted these paintings. So, you know, I, there's this moment where I, when I was first like reaching to try to understand him and, and the knowledge that, you know, he held the paintbrush and he touched these paintings, he created them. It's a, I think what I say in the film is it's, it's an extension of his very being. And I think that's different than a lot of the Holocaust era looted art stories, um, you know, stories like The Woman and Gold, um, which of course is, is a super famous painting. And, um, uh, but that, that was part of a family's collection. It wasn't a painting done by their family. And I think that there is um, a slight a slight difference and, and connection and family importance because of that. Well, I think that it actually goes further than that, if I, if I may, in that you're a creator and an artist in your own right as well, that there's a culture, there's a gene, that, uh, something that's been handed down um, from your great grandfather through the generations to you that connects you directly 
in terms of being an artist and creating um, and creating the world around you and creating the you know, views of, of his world as well. So there's a, you know, a link that, uh, that comes to life in your generation as well. Um, Absolutely. I'd like to turn, we had a couple of questions, some questions from the, uh, from the audience participants and turning to them, um, one question, kind of mesh up um, a couple of questions, uh, which regarded what could be done legally in terms of uh, recovering some of this art. And you ran into a lot of obstacles. Wesley uh, talked about some of the obstacles and, and maybe this is a question better for Wesley. Um, but we have a whole series of, uh, you know, of, of multinational or international issues. We have local U.S. issues between states and the federal government. How do we how do we deal with this? How do we cut through this thicket? Is there any way of coordinating this um, this process uh, nationally, internationally, and so on? Wesley, if you can give us just you know a, a little bit of an overview and maybe you know some hope for the future on this. The attempts for this have been going on for the past twenty five years since the Washington Conference principles, and it's not clear that this will happen so easily. There are attempts also in the European Union, and there have been attempts through, uh, uh, well, through the United Nations, through UNESCO and, and the like to deal with this, but it's not likely that we are going to get completely coordinated. Um, it, this, is, this is a matter primarily of national laws. It it's, remains a, a, an issue in regard to national laws primarily. I would add to that that I think I think a lot of people think, you know, if it's yours, then they should just give it back. And while that is, you know, that's the simple playground uh, concept, it's more complicated. And, and the sort of the example I like to give people is if the painting was in Poland and it was stolen by uh, a German and taken back to Germany and sold at an auction house in Paris and donated to a museum in Illinois and then moved to California, you know, now you're talking all sorts of layers um, of, of laws and timelines. And so these, these things are super complicated. If, if people, um, you know, are interested in learning more about it, obviously Wesley is, is a fount of knowledge about this. I did write um, in our own particular case more about it in my book for our particular story, but it is complicated. Yeah, um, it's not simple and it's been going, it's an ongoing process and, and thankfully we have people like Wesley who are deeply engaged with it and people like yourself who draw attention to it. Um, the process also, and this whole story really hinges in some ways or uncovers certain mysteries or questions that are not answered and you make that very explicit in the film. Uh, there are a couple of questions that weren't answered. One question that one of our uh, viewers or participants um, raised is, has there been follow-up with the women in Israel? Has mm -hmm. there been any connection, any, anything that you can further onto that story? Because that's just, I think, uh, anyone who watches the film is left totally puzzled by, by the sort of abrupt curtain that just drops at that point. Yeah. I have to confess and say, I hadn't actually watched my film in a long time and I rewatched it the other day and I actually cried again watching that scene. Um, so I'm still frustrated by it. Um, the film did screen in Israel and I don't have direct contact information for the woman in Israel that has my great grandfather's paintings, but I did um you know through her cousins re ask them to notify her that it was screening if she came to watch it she certainly did not introduce herself to me i don't think she was there i haven't heard anything since um i often get asked to speculate why she won't let me come see the paintings um I think it's a combination of things. I think she doesn't really understand my connection to them. I think she doesn't really understand the history. I think there might be a cultural um, difference. You know, she's originally from Poland, but she's lived in Israel a long time. I think that there could be language barriers. Um, so it's unfortunate. One of the things I feel bad about in the film that really is in the book, um, she, the family did 
snap some photographs of the paintings she has and did email them to me. So I have seen images of them. They're pretty lousy. Um, they're, a lot of the paintings have uh, glass. And so I can see reflections of people in them. And it's one of those cameras that prints the date on the image. And so um, it's just not, it's different. You know, it's like if I send you a postcard of the Mona Lisa and you at, and versus you actually going to the Louvre and standing there, if there wasn't a massive crowd, right? Like your difference in experience with the painting is very different. And so I would like to someday see them in person, but that has not been an option for me. Alex, um, in, the, in the film, we saw um, Elizabeth's reaction in Israel and, and the emotion and so on. But we never saw your reaction when, when that door slammed shut. How did you feel when you heard about it, that there were these paintings in Israel that were all of a sudden seemed to be accessible and then all of a sudden became inaccessible? Elizabeth and I have had many discussions on the subject. And I think uh, the short answer is neither one of us know. Mm. Yeah, I think. Okay. I think my dad and I are kind of practical about it. So I think that, um, you know, what the world, what the WJRO is doing and what Wesley Fisher does and other attorneys that, that practice in this area, I, I think that... <sighs> I think that the goal is noble. If it was looted, it should be returned, right? Like that's the base answer. But the the reality is that these things are complicated and the legal cases drag out for forever. And um, there aren't simple answers all the time or people don't necessarily want there to be simple answers. And so I think my dad and I just sort of have accepted that there are pieces that we have and there are pieces that we don't have. And if at least I can have photographs of the pieces, that at least will give us a better sense of my great grandfather's body of work. Um, and if there's anybody on here that follows me on social media, um, particularly on Instagram, uh, about, I wanna say it was about a month ago, I actually got an email from a man, um, who's in the book, but not in the film, um, who has several paintings and he now has two more. And I'm unclear how he got them. Um, I don't know if they're new, newly acquired or he forgot about them and they were in a basement, but I shared them on Instagram. And instantly my dad and I recognized the images. They're absolutely my great grandfather's style. Um, so, you know, I just hope that as people, discover things in attics or um, you know long forgotten storage sheds that they will because they know that I won't sue them for the return that they will at least step forward and share that they have them and I'm trying to create a sort of catalog resume of the paintings that we know about and where they are and maybe someday a cultural institution will bring them together for a showing that would be really um, that's my sort of next hope and dream for the paintings. So you, you kind of anticipated two questions, one from the uh, the chat and one from uh, that I was gonna ask. Uh, I was gonna ask the question about uh, an exhibition or anything like that. We'll, we'll leave that, you address that. But um, in, in the chat, it came out, um, one of the questions that someone asked was whether they have been, since the film was released and the book was released, um, have been more paintings surfaced? Have you, you been approached by other people um, with more information or, you know, if you could basically bring us up to date currently to where we stand now. Yeah, um, so um, I'm. there is one other story that was super interesting. Um, I got an email. This is how it happens. I get an email from somebody with an attachment and I, you know, open it and, and don't know what I'm going to find. Um, this gentleman uh his i forget the whole story exactly but he he was polish um he and his father left poland i think shortly uh maybe in the 50s um there was a remarriage there was a divorce and a remarriage and um his his uh stepfather had been involved with um an organization that promoted jewish culture i don't remember the exact name of the organization and they uh, had gifted him a reinecke painting for his 
30 plus years of service. And so this painting, um, it, when, this painting now belonged to this gentleman who was emailing me and wanted to know what I could tell him about it. Um, and actually at one point, offered to sell it to us we made an offer which uh he did not like and then he um he decided he wasn't interested in selling it so he still has it i sent him a copy of the book and i have not heard anything since um so these are how these things go i think people are are nervous about contacting me and then not quite sure and then they think they have something super valuable. It, it is emotionally super valuable. They're not particularly um, financially hugely valuable. And so I think people, um, I think that's disappointing to people who think I'm going to pay them huge sums of money for it. The other mystery that was um, evidenced in the film was the mystery of uh, it's the, the Werther brothers in in. Uh, Warsaw and in, in, in Canada, um, and the conflicting stories of how the paintings survived and were rescued after the war. Um, has there been any update on that? Anything new that you could bring to us? It, it was just, you know, just very odd to have two very different stories coming from yeah. two countries. So the brother in Canada, um, whose name is um, Moshe Wertheim, which is slightly confusing since my great grandfather is also Moshe, but the gentleman in, in Toronto did come to the screening of the film and he kind of laughed about the fact that he and his brother had these totally different stories. And actually after the screening called his brother in Poland to try to see if they could sort it out. Um, you know, I don't, I certainly don't think it's a malicious thing or, um, you know, they're trying to throw me off and, and not have the actual story. I think if you think about the stories that your parents have told you, if you have siblings, which I don't have siblings, but, you know, I think everybody sort of remembers it a little bit differently. And so I think that I'm guessing that pieces of both of their stories are probably somewhat correct. Um, and the reality is we'll, we will just never know. What I'm most um, curious about their story is that their father did have a significant number of paintings um, and they no longer have those. And as he says in the movie, his father gave away pieces. And I am waiting and hoping that someday the people to whom those pieces were given away uh, will step forward. Also Great. related, you might want to show the third painting that um, I know Lisa has uh, stored away because that's also an interesting Toronto connection. Well, before we do that, I, there are a question or actually two questions that were related to uh, Wesley that we just wanted to get to. Um, and the first is uh, that uh, on, on the list of persecuted artists that he mentioned, uh, where is it and where can anyone ex access it? Um, I think that's very interesting and important for people to know. It, it's going to be put up this fall on the website of the Jewish Digital Cultural Recovery Foundation, which is essentially sponsored by the Claims Conference and WJRO. Uh, and uh, it's a separate website, but it deals with this, these kinds of, this kind of information. There is a preliminary Jewish collectors list that is on that website. It's jdcrp.org but uh, it will take some time before the more massive uh, discussion of, of Jewish artists is there. Uh, Moshe Renetsky is clearly on that list, by the way. Okay, uh, the follow-up question to that refers to your excellent 2014 article about Serbia. How far have you gotten and have you got a list of missing art from the former Yugoslavia um, countries? Well, it, it depends very greatly on which country we're talking about. In the case of Serbia, the, uh, the research was done in part, but the in the case of Serbia, which has a law in regard to airless Jewish property, the Jewish communities of Serbia did not want to go into this question, even though they had the legal right to do so. And as a result, there have been no claims made under that law for such, uh, for such artworks. Um, there are also artworks that are in Serbia that were brought into the country illegally and otherwise. Uh, and they are, uh, they, the law does not cover those. It covers only those artworks that were taken in Serbia. We have managed to do the research now in regard to Croatia, 
And we certainly know at this point what was taken in Zagreb and uh, areas near Zagreb. Um, it's not complete, but there has been a fair amount of work on what those uh, artworks are and to whom they belonged and actually how they were distributed when the country became a communist country. The, uh, unfortunately, that's not, um, uh, there's no yet, not yet, a uh, restitution uh, or claims process in Croatia. So far as other countries are concerned, sometimes it's impossible. In, in Slovenia, when they tried to deal with this, eventually it was, there was such a group of, of people who were against it that the director of the Institute of Art History was fired. And so Slovenia is particularly difficult. Um, it, it varies, in other words. Well, see, actually just raised or pointed out a couple of issues that are important. One is I should mention, the WJRO, we just returned from Zagreb about two weeks ago um, from a negotiations, beginning negotiations and meetings with the Croatian government specifically related to this issue, um, among some other outstanding issues. And hopefully there'll be some progress in that regard in a practical sense that we can uh, inform you on in, in, in uh, you know, future months. Um, the other thing I, I just want to point out that even though, um, you know, Moshe Ranitsky was clearly a, a Polish artist, Jewish artist rooted in Poland, uh, the scenes of Polish Jewish life. Our conversation here is ranged across um, our, uh, you know, artifacts and, and cultural items taken from Jewish communities in Greece and Serbia, Croatia. It's not just one country. The, the Nazis uh, effort, as we all know, but we, sometimes we don't think about it that clearly arranged uh, all across Europe and items were transported all across Europe um, mm -hmm. and tracking it down goes as far as Israel, the United States, and Canada, among other places. So it's really a, a difficult multinational effort, um, and it requires a lot of work, and, and Wesley has been spearheading that, but also uh, people uh, you know, recovering their own family histories, like Elizabeth has done and Alex, um, are clearly important uh, actors in that as well. I think we have time for one last question. Um, and Elizabeth, I'm gonna go back to you, which is an interesting question that someone just raised in the chat, which, did anybody offer up any fakes or forgeries? Was anyone was there any attempts to uh, pass off something um, that you ran across? Yeah. So, um, well, my favorite story is that there is a company in China that is selling. Um, you can you can order two different Reineke images from them. Um, and the images are actually paintings that were um, put up for sale on an auction house in Poland. And so the copyright, at least in the United States, I, Wesley might know more about this than I do, but and the copyright is uh, the, the death of the artist plus 70 years. So my great grandfather, it's been, you know, 70 plus years since he died. And so there really is no copyright on the image. So my dad and I actually ordered these paintings from China. Um, and the website gives you the choice of having the painting. Oh, and you can order any size you want and you can have it signed either with the artist's name um, or you can request that the person that's painting it, sign it. So we requested one of each. And um, when they arrived, we decided that they did look like my great grandfather's paintings, but there were certain, the brush strokes seemed different. And, you know, I'd like to think that, that we would have known that they were fakes. So I did take a a big Sharpie marker on the back and wrote, you know, fake, because when I'm long gone, I don't want somebody to think they have an original. Well, I mean, it's a classic story. I'm not sure. How do you even respond to that? Other than say that we just took it to another geographical area, including China as well. <laughs> into this. So it really is a, a global story. Um, I think, unfortunately, that we've run out of time. We could really have spent a lot more time um, sitting and discussing these issues and 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 all this, and I really want to thank everyone that joined us today. I especially want to thank our panel members, Dr. Wesley Fisher, Elizabeth Reinecke, and of course Alex, who have joined us today. Um, I want to remind everyone that the fifth annual hashtag My Property Story social media campaign will launch in January 2024. Um, it launched four years ago. The hashtag My Property Story social media campaign 
highlights the personal stories of survivors and their descendants, as we've just heard an example, by shining a light on the unprecedented theft of property from Jewish people and communities during the Shoah and its aftermath. Over the course of the campaign, hundreds of thousands of people from all around the world, including survivors, family members, experts, and others, participated by sharing stories, videos, and photos through social media about lives that were forever changed by the Holocaust and that showed how their homes, land, businesses, and personal possessions were powerful links to their past. You can find out more information about the campaign at www.wjro.org. Dot il dot, uh, slash MPS. We hope you enjoyed today's webinar. Please be on the lookout for more information for our next webinar. And thank you again, everybody, for joining and participating.